when I listen to statements about Cuba made by United States officials, including our elected representatives, when I read stories about Cuba in the American press, when I discuss Cuba with friends and acquaintances, I'm constantly amazed, amazed by the interpretations given, and even more amazed by the emotion with which those interpretations are given. How is it that a small island nation of less than 10 million people, fewer people than live in New York City, can generate such fear, hostility, and outright hysteria in the United States. A country of over 220 million people, the greatest economic and military power of the Western world. Why does Cuba command so much attention in this country? Why is a small developing nation so disturbing to our political, economic, and military leaders. With all its glitter and wealth, the United States draws endless waves of impoverished immigrants across its borders. Every month, countless thousands of undocumented aliens enter the country illegally from Mexico, the Caribbean, Central and South America, pushed by grinding poverty, pulled by expectations of a better life. Haitians, Dominicans, Colombians, and Cubans over 100,000 Cubans in 1980 alone, a mass exodus that has been attributed to the alleged failures of a socialist government. Yet how is it possible to make meaningful distinctions between one country's poverty and another's? How can we say that the desire of Cubans to have a piece of the American pie is somehow different from that of Jamaicans, or Hondurans, or Puerto Ricans? Why do we say that Cubans have voted with their feet? And we don't say the same about millions of undocumented Mexicans. This is a documentary about recent emigration from socialist Cuba. What moved nearly 125,000 Cubans to enter the United States illegally between April and September 1980? And how have people understood that exodus, Cubans and Americans alike? These questions and their implications are explored by James Otis Smith and Russell Bartley from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. For some 15 months, they probed the social and political realities of the Cuban experience from inside Cuba itself to the exile community and resettlement camps in the United States. What prompted this most recent exodus of Cubans from their homeland? The exodus was sparked by an incident at the Peruvian Embassy in Havana, where on April 1, 1980, a Cuban security guard was killed when 12 Cuban citizens smashed a stolen bus through the embassy gates. The 12 requested political asylum. This was the latest of several such incidents involving the Peruvian and Venezuelan embassies. The Cuban government now responded by removing normal security protection from the Embassy of Peru. It charged that Peru had actually provoked violent entries to its diplomatic mission by systematically withholding visas from Cuban citizens who sought them through normal channels, while at the same time expediting visas to anyone who broke into the embassy with a request for a political asylum. As the Cuban authorities saw it, this was part of a wider scheme orchestrated by the United States to discredit Cuba in world opinion. All Cubans who wished to leave the country, the government announced, were free to do so. Within a week, an estimated 10,000 discontented Cubans had packed the Peruvian embassy grounds, and the situation was rapidly turning into an international incident. By April 17th, over 500 Cubans had been flown out of the country to Costa Rica, but flights were soon suspended when the Cuban government announced that it would only permit emigrants to travel directly to the countries where they desired to resettle. Cuban leaders viewed Costa Rica as a pawn of the United States in a cynical propaganda charade in which the small Central American country was being used to promote a distorted image of Cuban society. By the third week in April, the Cuban government had let it be known that private boats would be allowed to pick up Cubans wishing to leave the island at the port of Mariel, 25 miles west of Havana. On April 22nd, the party newspaper Granma published an official announcement that anyone who wanted to emigrate could do so through Mariel. We have removed our guards from the Florida Peninsula, the paper declared, and what the U.S. media would dub the Freedom Flotilla started in earnest. 
Boats of every description began arriving at Key West, laden with undocumented Cubans. 3,000 by April 28, over 17,000 by May 6th, nearly 40,000 by May 15th, and on through the summer until the total surpassed 100,000. Resettlement camps were hastily opened at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, and Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Angry demands for federal assistance came from the affected states. Local communities expressed fear and hostility. The media labeled Fidel Castro a fiend and unconscionable tyrant, while reporting spreading incidents of violence and abuse as the new exiles filled the camps. And the White House sought desperately to defuse what in a precarious election year had become a political time bomb. Such are the bare facts of the Cuban exodus, the stuff of press headlines and television newscast. Or are they? Are the answers really that simple? Even our policymakers recognize that the facts of the exodus are deeper than how they've been presented to us in the commercial media. I think the worst thing, the worst problem we face, at least it is the worst problem I face, in trying to develop policies, in trying to communicate uh, an understanding of what the real problems are in the region, is that we have very inadequate images to explain uh, what is happening in Latin America. Let me put it another way. The images we have are dated and I think fundamentally incorrect. And I would say, in addition, from a pedagogical standpoint, demoralizing uh, to people of Latin origin. Indeed, the Cuban exodus brings us face to face with ourselves as individuals, as a people, as a nation living in a larger world with other peoples and other nations. How we understand the Cuban exodus matters because it relates to how we understand ourselves. It matters just to plain Americans. It matters in terms of how we treat each other. It even matters when one thinks of the heavy and I think fundamentally unstoppable flow of migration into the United States, it even is going to mean who we are. We, the American public, saw the Cuban exodus through the eyes of the U.S. media, which in large measure gave us a distorted picture drawn from worn out cliches about the world in which we live. In the first days following the occupation of the Peruvian embassy in Havana, the American press pronounced the Cuban revolution a failure. Headlines told us that the Cubans were fleeing in search of a better life, that economic hardship was spurring the rush to leave, that Fidel Castro's revolutionary dreams had gone up in smoke. Just four days after the Cuban government removed its security guards from the Peruvian embassy, the New York Times, the Miami Herald, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Christian Science Monitor all carried editorials on the swelling mass of would-be emigrants inside the embassy compound. Wrote the Miami Herald. Fidel Castro first created the tension between Cuba and Peru and Venezuela by denying customary political asylum to several dozen Cubans who had forced their way into those embassies during the past months. According to the Washington Post, the incident at the Peruvian embassy is as close as Cuba ever gets to a free election. The judgment reflected at the Peruvian embassy is of a country that offers such an unpromising future that the instant an opportunity appears, 10,000 people are ready, at great risk, just to go. Editorialized the Los Angeles Times. On the basis of available information, it appears that this is a case of economic desperation feeding ideological disillusionment. The Miami Herald editorial was a blatant misstatement of the facts. Those persons who had forced their way into the embassies of Peru and Venezuela were not political refugees. The Cuban government had in fact authorized their departure from the island months before. Their problem was rather the unwillingness of any foreign country to issue them entry visas. They did not qualify for normal immigrant status and thus were moved to commit acts of violence in the hope of being granted political asylum.
Editorial comment in the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and other leading U.S. newspapers assured us that the events at the Peruvian embassy demonstrated the unworkability of the Cuban system. Disturbingly, these comments made no pretense of analyzing a complex social phenomenon with deep historical roots. In sharp contrast to the European press, which offered much more thoughtful commentary on the exodus and its causes. By and large, press coverage in the United States remained locked within rigid Cold War categories. Washington Post, April 10th. Carter warns of Cuba as Caribbean threat. Columnist Jack Anderson, April 21st. Possible Soviet missile sites in Cuba. Miami Herald, April 22nd. Cuba said to set sights on Latin American targets. Events in Cuba during the spring and summer of 1980 produced hundreds of stories and reports in the U.S. media. With the onset of the sea lift from Mariel to Key West, coverage broadened to include human interest vignettes, life in the internment camps, and Washington's confused policy responses to the sudden uncontrolled arrival of Cuban immigrants. Prominently placed headlines, however, continued to equate the exodus with a failed revolution in Cuba. For example, only two days after half the Cuban population turned out all across the island in the largest demonstration ever of popular support for Cuba's revolutionary leadership, the New York Times carried the headline, Fidel Castro is floundering. In the accompanying editorial, the Times suggested that the Cuban revolution had run aground and that Fidel Castro was losing his hold on Cuba. Of all the leading U.S. newspapers, only the Christian Science Monitor pointed out that the would-be Cuban immigrants were not, in fact, refugees. The problem for the thousands who want to leave is that there is no obvious legal resort to international law, so long as Castro actually does not deny their human right to leave. As long as they are simply seeking to migrate, they are not refugees, under the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees definition. Migration is essentially a bilateral matter, a country willing to let people go and a country willing to receive them. Despite contradictory statements and innuendos by White House spokesmen, U.S. foreign policy officials also understood that the Cubans were not, in fact, political refugees and that it was not Fidel Castro or the Cuban government who prevented them from leaving. And we are now facing another aspect of the originality of the Cubans and of Castro. Name me another communist leader who says to his people, if you don't want to stay, you can go. And they are going, or from our perspective, coming. If the exodus produced a furor in the United States, it was a far more serious matter for the Cubans, and consequently received even wider coverage in the Cuban media, coverage that presented the exodus in a dramatically different light. <laughs> The exodus and related events dominated Cuban domestic news throughout the spring and early summer. On April 24th, the official party newspaper Granma began running a daily calendar of news from Mariel with details of arriving boats and departing emigrants. All papers carried extensive coverage of three massive demonstrations of popular support for the Cuban government that took place on April 19th, May 1st, and May 17th as well as of a violent confrontation on May 2nd in front of the U.S. interest section in Havana between several hundred applicants for entry visas to the United States and angry residents from surrounding neighborhoods. This incident at the interest section, which is located in the old U.S. Embassy building, was seen by the Cuban media as one more in a long line of hostile incidents provoked by the United States to undermine Cuba's image abroad, a dramatic example of the hypocrisy and deceit of U.S. policy toward the island's socialist government. The several hundred visa seekers, most of them former counter-revolutionary prisoners, had been summoned to the interest section by U.S. diplomatic officials, where they were told it was the Cuban government that was responsible for the delay in their departure 
and not the United States. The frustrated Cubans reacted violently by turning on a growing crowd of curious onlookers, throwing pieces of construction material and shouting anti-government slogans. They quickly provoked their fellow countrymen and, confronted with their angry response, took refuge inside the interest section building. While the U.S. media reported that the peaceful visa seekers had been attacked by busloads of government thugs, the Cuban media expressed indignation at what it viewed as a cynical misrepresentation of events. In striking contrast with the U.S. media, which offered the American public no insight at all into what the Cubans were saying about the exodus, Cuban media reported extensively on how these events were being presented in the United States. Granma, for example, published dispatches from Western news agencies exactly as they appeared in the American press. The following news dispatches call for no comment. Suffice it to read them to realize the Yankees' embarrassment and perplexity over the crisis they themselves created with their blockade, their violations of Cuban laws, their encouragement of illegal departures, their demagoguery and lies, their hypocrisy and other crimes. We publish these news dispatches for our people's enjoyment. The Cuban media also drew a connection between American responses to the exodus and recent political changes throughout the region. Esto tiene que ver con el prestigio de Cuba. Tiene que ver con el auge del movimiento revolucionario. For all the virtues of a free press, there was a disturbing uniformity in the way American television and mass circulation newspapers presented the Cuban exodus to us, the American public. Even more disturbing was a marked coincidence of views between the government and the media in their explanations of the causes of the exodus and what it tells us about the Cuban revolution. On April 14th, outgoing Secretary of State Cyrus Vance declared, The rush to the Peruvian embassy compound in Havana by some 10,000 Cubans seeking asylum is stark evidence of the oppressive conditions under which Cubans live. On April 27th, Vice President Mondale stated, There is no better proof of the failure of Castro's revolution than the dramatic exodus which is currently taking place. On May 14th, President Carter asserted, Tens of thousands of Cubans are fleeing the repression of the Castro regime. No less disquieting are the frequent discrepancies between what U.S. government officials say publicly about a situation like the Cuban exodus and what, as professionals, they know to be the facts. When you started out uh, speaking about inadequate images to explain what is happening in the world, I wonder if in just a few words you could maybe describe the correct images for understanding what it is that is happening in Cuba now. The meaning of the exodus, uh, both for us and for the Cubans. What does it tell us about the Cuban Revolution? Uh, my first comment is I don't think you can judge uh, the Cuban Revolution um, by the exodus. Um, I think that some of the exodus um, is due to special uh, characteristics. That is to say, people who in fact have relatives in Miami and are trying to join them. Uh, some of it uh, has another kind of special characteristic. Uh, people who um, had found ways to get around the restrictions uh, and the egalitarian provisions of the revolution. Guys like those that had, uh, say, uh, tapped in, run extra wires in ways that the uh, electric company couldn't count the kilowatts uh, so that they could run some extra lights. Uh, and uh, who have, as part of the tightening up in Cuba, that uh, is part of the universal tightening up in the world uh, because of the energy crisis, have been found out and have been uh, either socially ostracized or in some cases uh, stuck in jail. Um, Castro's opening a lot of jails and uh, 
letting those people uh, come out. Uh, and he finds that easier uh, to cope with. Uh, uh, it reduces the number of mouths he has to feed um, uh, than, uh, than trying to, to, uh, to, to support them in jail. Um, th then there's a category of people who, for one reason or another, just you know, haven't made it um, in the system. And they've got this attractive place. I mean, it may not be that attractive when they get there. But uh, the, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Uh, that gives them a chance to start over again uh, in the United States. Uh, so they're going to come. Um, I think that they're going to have to give, they, they will find a vast increase in personal freedom. They will also perhaps find uh, an increase in social indifference. Uh, because one of the areas where the Cuban Revolution has, I think, made really major difference uh, is in the whole area of social services, uh, health, uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and nutrition. And there, you know, they may find that uh, we are still uh, rather harsh about many of those kinds of things. Uh, uh, so, and particularly in the medical field. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would try to shy away from, uh, from definitive uh, judgments. Uh, I would say in the, you know, in the course of time, uh, Cuba was an interesting country uh, in the 30s. It was an interesting country in different ways in the 50s. It is today and it will be 20 years from now. And in each of these phases, it has been, in fact, intimately tied to us. I think it will continue to be that way. We have just heard an important statement about Cuba and Cuban immigrants by an informed spokesman of the United States government. What has the spokesman said? What has he told us about Cuban society and the reasons people have left that society? It's important to stress here that events like the recent exodus from Cuba are complex events and cannot be explained with simplistic assertions that ignore the real world setting in which those events have occurred. In this specific case, a responsible and informed government official has made some basic observations about the nature of the 1980 exodus from Cuba that call into serious question much of what has been said about that event in the mass media and in public statements by government spokesmen. We can't judge the Cuban revolution by the exodus of Cuban citizens from the island. This is the first thing that Inaudi tells us about the mass immigration of Cubans to the United States, a straightforward statement that directly contradicts what we were told by the highest officials of our government and what was repeated by much of the commercial media. Why? Why shouldn't we conclude that when over 100,000 people seek desperately to leave a small neighboring country, that country's political system has failed, or at the very least is in serious trouble? because we must first take into account the circumstances in which those people chose to leave, the actual circumstances of a particular society with its own unique history. The Cuban exodus, they now reminds us, was due to special characteristics. It's precisely these special characteristics that have been missing from official government statements about the exodus, as well as from most news accounts. Public interpretations of what was happening in Cuba rested by and large on oversimplified formulations. Communism doesn't work. Castro is a tyrant. Socialism is an inhuman system. But what are these special characteristics that an Audi speaks of? Leaving aside for a moment the personality of Fidel Castro and whatever our views may be on socialism as a system, can we identify other more basic forces at work in the Cuban exodus? forces peculiar to Cuban society, forces rooted in Cuban history. Family, consumer enticements, social alienation. For historical reasons, there is a large Cuban emigre population in the United States. Many Cubans have family here and are moved to leave Cuba by a normal desire to join their relatives. <laughs> 
This has been an important and continuing factor in the emigration of Cubans from their homeland, a factor essentially unrelated to daily life in Cuba. Like people from other developing countries, Cubans are often captivated by the material abundance of the United States. They are drawn to a way of life more illusory than real, whose social costs and human toll they fail to comprehend. In Einaudi's words, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And there are the system beaters, people who purposely circumvent the egalitarian provisions of the Cuban system, or who in some way offend social norms and are moved by peer pressure or legal sanctions to indulge their nonconformist ways elsewhere. Family, material wants, nonconformity three key elements of the Cuban exodus. Migration is a worldwide phenomenon. It's influenced by a variety of factors, both internal and external. Political factors, demographic factors, economic factors, even climate and natural disasters. It's a common feature of our own hemisphere and affects the lives of millions of people throughout the region. It affects Cuba. Indeed, Cuba lies in the midst of a massive migrant stream that sweeps across the Caribbean basin and into the United States. It is only one source feeding that stream, and by no means the most important source. At the same time, it is drawn into the stream by many of the same forces that are felt in other Latin American and Caribbean countries. It's the interaction of these region-wide forces with the specific social and political realities of Cuba that explains the mass migration of Cubans to the United States. You know, to understand how this thing was generated in the first place, uh, to in talk about a discussion of economic conditions in Cuba and not talk about the American blockade of the Cuban economy for 20 years is to miss the entire point. The economy is... Uh, of Cuba is, is not immune to the types of troubles that have affected economies throughout the Caribbean, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti. I mean, it's every country in the Caribbean is facing the same thing, and you get this tremendous pressure building up and building up, and suddenly it just it just snapped. But to uh, to not understand, uh, uh, on one hand, the tremendous draw of Miami, and on the other hand, the, the just relentless hostility of the American government uh, and the relentless economic uh, uh, harassment and, and uh, isolation of the Cuban government by the American government is to miss the point of why these people came in the first place. All societies experiencing an outmigration of their citizens, including our own, are subject to similar kinds of forces. There are pressures within society itself that make people want to leave, that make them want to escape those pressures, and there are attractions outside real or imagined, that draw people away. In the language of the social sciences, there are push factors and there are pull factors. We should note here that Americans immigrate from their society too, significant numbers of them, to Canada, to Mexico, to Europe, and other countries around the world. They leave for many different reasons, political, economic, personal. And in every case, there are, they are both pushed and pulled from their homeland. There are aspects of American society that they want to leave behind, and aspects of another society to which they are drawn. The sociological principles here are the same, whether we speak of Cuban immigrants in the United States, or, for example, of American retirement communities in Mexico, disaffected Afro-Americans living in Portugal, are U.S. war resistors in Canada. The refugees brought with them tales of terror, stories that gushed forth now that they had arrived in the land of free speech. What are the forces at work in Cuban society that have moved hundreds of thousands of men and women to leave their homeland over the past 20 years? What are the elements of Cuba's social order that tend to push certain people out? And what are the external attractions that work to pull people away? Cuba because of its closeness and because of the enormous ties that exist between 
it and the United States at the family level, at the basic human level. We have, what, a million Cubans in the United States, 500,000 of them uh, now dominating the city of Miami, essentially, in terms of uh, its press, its politics, uh, its banking, uh, its entrepreneurship. Um, they've been going back to Cuba. Last year, 100,000 Cuban Americans visited Cuba. And that was very good for the Cuban government because it earned it a lot of dollars for an exchange that it needed. It was also very unsettling because what Cubans saw was relatives, fellow Cubans, who had made it, uh, not in a disciplined and self-depriving egalitarian society, but in the ebullient, wild consumerism of Miami. And that added, I think, quite greatly to the unrest and tension that was latent within Cuban society. Societies are structured organisms, all societies. They are ordered. They are formed of particular sets of social relations that make demands on the individual citizen. The degree to which these social relations reflect a popular consensus on society's priorities determines in large measure the options available to the individual citizen in responding to societal demands. Factors of physical space, history, and custom also affect these options. In Cuba, as in every society, there are built-in constraints on individual behavior. These constraints lie in Cuba's limited size, in its historical relationship to the United States, and in the social priorities established by the country's political process. Cuba, Inaudi reminds us, is a disciplined, self-depriving, egalitarian society which means it is a society organized around collectivist goals. Goals that are not central to our society, but which are nonetheless morally based goals rooted in a genuine concern for the welfare of people and therefore constitute a legitimate organizing principle. In spite of the fact that we still have marginals, unfortunately, and some declassed and antisocial elements. We have fewer of them than any other country in the hemisphere. We have fewer robberies, though there are thieves, a lower crime rate, almost no drugs, no prostitution, no gambling. No society has a healthier moral atmosphere in the entire hemisphere than our society. No society has achieved the moral standards that our society has in the 21 years of the revolution with a sense of justice, a sense of honor, a sense of dignity, with a high regard and admiration for accomplishment, work, and sacrifice. The Cuban Revolution was a popular response to social injustices rooted in the structures of Cuban society itself, the same injustices that today afflict other Latin American societies, Poverty, malnutrition, illiteracy, the distorted economic priorities of neocolonial dependency. The basic premise of the revolution was that Cuban society had to be transformed, that social justice could not be achieved merely by ousting a corrupt dictator, because the privileged segments of Cuban society would never allow it. As in the other Latin American countries, existing economic structures did not address issues of social injustice, and were by their very nature incapable of resolving them. While by some economic indices pre-revolutionary Cuba enjoyed a relatively high standard of living, 
No manipulation of the statistical record can hide the fundamental inequities of Cuban society before the revolution. According to data summarized in the 1949 atlas, published jointly by Harvard University and the Cuban Agricultural Ministry, the standard of living of most Cubans is not as high as the national income would allow, particularly that of the campesinos. Their houses are poor, their diet inadequate, and public services are often not available. A high percentage of the population suffers from intestinal parasites. These parasites rarely kill their victims, but sap their vitality, their capacity for work, predispose them for other diseases, and thus help to raise the mortality rate. Most doctors are concentrated in large cities. Many of the rural areas do not get medical attention. A vast percentage of children attending public schools in Cuba do not complete their studies. Only 10% of all first grade pupils receive their diplomas. One of the chief reasons for the plight of the poor farmers is the system of land tenure in Cuba. Only 16.3% of the cultivated land is owned by the farmers. The danger of this system is obvious. As Cuban society was in fact transformed during the 1960s and 70s, social tensions grew. People whose personal interests were prejudiced by the new collectivist goals turned against the revolution. Many left the country. Others sought a tenuous, frequently short-lived accommodation with the new order. And significant numbers worked actively to subvert the revolution, often in collaboration with American intelligence operatives. Yet the revolution survived. Against great historical odds, it survived. And it has transformed Cuban society so completely that one can no longer seriously contemplate a return to pre-revolutionary times. As Inaudi emphasizes, the Cuban revolution has made a major difference in the whole area of social services, which is to say, it has improved the quality of life for a large majority of the population. In 1958, on the eve of the revolution, Cuba had a population of six and a half million people. One out of every six Cubans lived in Havana. Half of the country's medical doctors practiced in Havana. 38% of working age males were unemployed. 50% of working women were employed as domestic servants. One out of every three Cubans was functionally illiterate. Half of Cuba's workforce labored in agriculture. Another 25% held blue collar jobs or worked in the services. The remainder were professionals or lived from their investments. Of the rural workers, half a million were unemployed eight months of the year. By 1978, with a population approaching 10 million, average life expectancy had risen from 58 years to 72 years. Infant mortality had dropped to levels near that of the United States, and illiteracy had all but been eradicated. Basic health care was available to the entire population, as was adequate nutrition and education. Parasites, poliomyelitis, and tuberculosis traditional afflictions of Cuba's poor had virtually been eliminated. Unemployment, too, had largely disappeared from the everyday realities of Cuban life. So basic are the human issues raised by the Cuban Revolution, so vital its social priorities, that the individual citizen's personal life options are of necessity more sharply defined than in the United States. The person who fails to perceive the significance of what Cuban society has achieved what it has achieved in a Latin American and third world context may well dismiss present day Cuba as a dismal failure when compared to the freewheeling competitive consumerism of the United States. That same person, however, is faced with a broad consensus among fellow Cuban citizens that American consumerism is the problem rather than the solution, which is not to say that Cubans don't aspire to a higher material standard of living. The issue is how to provide adequately for everybody. Cubans who nonetheless look to Miami for their aspirations confront a social order at home that leaves them few options. Cuba as a country is not large enough to accommodate alternative lifestyles. The individual nonconformist cannot find anonymity by merely changing location, as one might do in the United States. Cuban culture itself makes this difficult as the gregarious nature of Cuba's Afro-Latin folkways keeps the individual always in the community eye. And when the individual offends community values, as he does when he looks to Miami for his cues, 
He is censured by the community. He is labeled an antisocial, a marginal, or lumping, or simply scum. This is not government repression, although it reflects adherence to a political program. It's rather an expression of Cuba's social consensus, very much like the love it or leave it sentiment that characterized broad segments of U.S. society during the Vietnam War. We see this clearly in the angry verse of Cuban poet Eliseo Diego. Te convence la mesa bien servida, la ropa luz y seña de tus amos, anillo al dedo y a la oreja en ramos, chirimbolos de plata repulida. Tomar la quince afana la medida, correr entre los perros tras los gamos, holgar mientras los otros trabajamos, tu vientre al aire, es para ti la vida. Puede que alguna vez, por fin comprendas, que solo es pan el que se da un amigo, y vale más el cándido que el fuerte. Pena me da que tan barato vendas la luz de tu país al enemigo. Vete a pastar los lujos de la muerte. For those who view the Western consumer economies as an intolerable waste of human and natural resources in an increasingly resource-deficient world, as the cause and not the solution of humanity's mounting problems, socialism represents an alternative approach to meeting society's basic material and creative needs. Those who defend the Western consumer model, on the other hand, see societies like Cuba as prisons to be escaped as a threat to be combated. This has been the view of U.S. policymakers from the beginning of the Cuban Revolution. It is a view deeply rooted in the history of relations between the two countries and bears importantly on the causes of the recent Cuban exodus. For most of its history as an independent nation, the United States has cast a menacing shadow over all the islands of the Caribbean, seeking to acquire them as territorial possessions or otherwise bind them permanently into its sphere of influence. Cuba has been the most coveted of these countries, and, after Puerto Rico, the one that has most suffered American intrusion into its internal affairs. Over a century and a half ago, U.S. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams immortalized American attitudes toward Cuba in a now classic statement of political metaphor. There are laws of political as well as of physical gravitation, and if an apple, severed by the tempest from its native tree, cannot choose but fall to the ground, Cuba, forcibly disjoined from its own unnatural connection with Spain and incapable of self-support, can gravitate only toward the North American Union, which, by the same law of nature, cannot cast her off from its bosom. For nearly four centuries, Cuba was a colony of Spain. Its main product was sugarcane, and its economy rested on slavery. The seeds of Cuban independence were sown by the revolt of the neighboring English colonies in 1776 and by the patriotic rebellions of Spanish America in the early 1800s. Spain did not relinquish its hold on Cuba, however, until the close of the 19th century when the United States finally intervened militarily to impose its own dominion over the island. The belligerency of the United States toward Spain's last New World possessions Indeed, what would become this country's characteristic arrogance toward all the peoples of the Caribbean was blatantly expressed on the eve of the Spanish-American War by the official historian of the U.S. War Department, Mr. Murat Halstead. We have little concern how Africa, Asia, or Australia are cut up. But the American islands are ours for the hereafter, and we shall in good time annex Cuba as we have annexed Florida, Texas, and California, and add her tropical riches to the patrimony of our people. While the United States did not actually annex Cuba, it did establish a protectorate over the island, and in fact turned Cuba into an American dependency. As a condition for withdrawing its occupation forces, it required the Cubans to accept an amendment to their constitution which granted the United States the unilateral right to intervene in Cuba's internal affairs whenever Washington deemed it necessary for the protection of American interests. The Platt Amendment, as it was known, would tie Cuba to the United States for the first third of the 20th century. American influence quickly penetrated every aspect of Cuban life. The military intervention was followed by a more insidious invasion of dollars and alien ways designed to Americanize Cuba once and for all. In 
The process of domination was candidly described as early as 1899 by American publicist James Fernald. The ruling class in any dependency naturally bring with them the habits and ideals of their own nation in the construction and furnishing of their houses, the materials for their clothing, and the provision of their tables, and in a thousand other matters, they follow the style of their own country as closely as climatic and other conditions allow, and naturally import the means of so doing from their own land. The resident traders, the missionaries, teachers, scientists, explorers, and tourists of the dominant nation all foster the same tendency. The natives of the dependency become ambitious to copy the ruling class, whereby the demand for the products of the dominant nation is continually increased. The ever-deepening impact of the Western industrial economies on the world's non-industrial societies has been one of the central issues of this century. It has profoundly affected all the countries of Latin America and lies at the very heart of our relations with Cuba. Historically, the gradual Americanization of people's values and aspirations in Latin America has intensified already sharp social divisions throughout the hemisphere, while at the same time alienating local political elites from the real needs of their own societies. Former Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista was a classic example. <laughs> The mechanisms of expanding American influence were also understood by many Latin Americans. At the turn of the century, the distinguished Uruguayan writer, José Enrique Rodó, called attention to the voluntary participation of Latin Americans themselves in the promotion of North American values and influence. Se imita aquel en cuyo superioridad o cuyo prestigio we imitate creen. him in whose superiority and prestige we believe. So it is that the vision of a voluntarily de-Latinized America, regenerate in the manner of its northern archetype, floats already through the dreams of many who are sincerely interested in our future. We have our mania for northern ways. Even before Rodó, Cuba's national hero, José Martí, had called attention to the same self-defeating tendency among many of his own countrymen. En unos, es el excesivo amor al norte, la expresión With some people, this excessive love for the North is the expression of such an impetuous desire for progress that they do not see that ideas, like trees, must come from deep roots and compatible soil in order to take hold and prosper. With others, their Yankee mania is the innocent result of occasional flights of fancy, as when one judges the interior of a home by the warmth and decor of the front parlor. With still others, the fashion is to scorn everything native. They can imagine nothing more elegant than to drink to the foreigner's breeches and ideas and to strut about the world as puffed up as the pom-pom tail of a fondled lapdog. In Cuba, the created needs of American consumption spread rapidly among the country's privileged classes, setting the rhythm and tone of Cuba's social and economic development throughout the first half of this century. As in other Latin American countries, the upper strata of Cuban society embraced the U.S. model of progress and enthusiastically imitated American ways. The island was open to American investors who quickly dominated key sectors of the Cuban economy. Large tracts of land passed into the hands of U.S. citizens while trade and communications were controlled by North Americans. And in a society with deep African roots, white Cubans relegated black Cubans to society's fringes. In the 50s, the city of Havana was the laboratory for what is called in the Western world, the consumer society. The process developed rhythmically upwards. The dime store chains, mail order department stores, big name gasoline stations, the supermarkets, and the feverish importation of luxury items, perfumes and jewelry, automobiles and giveaway contests. Havana became a modern city, to the tourist, a terrestrial tropical paradise. The penetration had its music and its media, modern advertising, the system of contagious repetitions which culminated with an important event. These images move, they can be seen, they're in your own home. Television arrives. 
This promotional drive to foster American-style consumer habits was aimed at Latin America as a whole and has continued unabated down to the present day. The United States, through the aggressive pursuit of its own commercial interests, promoted economic priorities among its neighbors that benefited the few while failing to meet the needs of the many. In Cuba, this process was already well advanced when the revolution of 1959 brought it to an abrupt halt. All that has transpired between Cuba and the United States since the revolution, including the mass emigration of Cuban citizens to this country, derives from that unprecedented challenge to American economic interests. For more than 20 years, the United States has responded to this challenge with implacable hostility. It trained thousands of Cuban exiles for the ill-conceived Bay of Pigs invasion in April 1961 and nearly precipitated a thermonuclear war 18 months later as a result of its efforts to destroy Cuba's revolutionary government. What was presented to the American public as a blow to Soviet expansionism as a loss of face for Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in his eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with President Kennedy, was in historical perspective a victory for the Cuban Revolution. Kennedy was forced to renounce U.S. armed intervention in Cuba as the condition for Soviet withdrawal of nuclear missiles from the island. If John Kennedy renounced the use of overt force against Cuba, this did not deter him nor his subsequent administrations from employing covert means to crush the Cuban Revolution. Writing in the April 5, 1981 issue of the New York Times Magazine, veteran foreign correspondent Tad Schultz recalls that the CIA had sought to recruit alleged mafia figures to assassinate Fidel Castro, and that for years, the United States continued to send in CIA teams who would burn crops and sabotage industrial projects in Cuba. Since the early 1960s, Cuban exile terrorist groups have been allowed to flourish in the United States groups like Omega-7 and Alpha-66, groups who are committed to armed violence, who routinely perpetrate wanton acts of terrorism both in and outside the U.S., who are the very antithesis of our democratic ideals. These groups regularly target Cuban diplomatic missions and representatives here and abroad, and they continue to conduct armed forays against Cuba itself. They do these things with the acquiescence of the American government, which by 1981 had again turned openly belligerent toward Cuba, abandoning even a pretense of moral justification for its new policy. We must demonstrate to everyone that we can win, that we can be successful, declared a ranking State Department official according to the April 6, 1981 issue of U.S. News and World Report. Policy options currently under serious consideration include economic sanctions, military blockade, covert CIA operations against Cuba's allies in Africa, and invasion of Cuba itself, all of which has heightened tensions in Cuba and increased the burden on the Cuban people. The resulting diversion of limited resources away from social needs to defense and security needs has been primarily the consequence of U.S. policy toward Cuba. The historical record is distressingly clear. At no time in its history has Cuba enjoyed an equitable relationship with the United States. Never has the United States looked upon Cuba as anything more than prey to be exploited. Decades of imposed dependency and cultural Americanization made an indelible mark on broad segments of the Cuban population. Those same segments who, following the revolution, would emigrate to the United States, or if they remained in Cuba, would have difficulty adjusting to the new order. American policy toward the new Cuba, in turn, appealed precisely to these disaffected elements, whom it has used, often cynically, in a relentless effort to undermine the revolution and recapture lost control over the island's affairs. In a real sense, those Cubans who have come to the United States are themselves products of this policy. A year after the 1980 exodus from Cuba began, the Milwaukee Journal ran a series of articles on the experiences of the new emigres in the state of Wisconsin. One of these articles begins like this. A year ago at this time, he had a Cuban name, Roberto Miranda Hernandez. He lived in a country where a lot of things were free, but where he was not free. His government more or less decided his entitlements and his station in life. Today, his name is more American, Robert Miranda. He lives in a country where not many goods and services are free, but where he is free. His entitlements and his station in life, in many ways, are up to him. At age 37, 
it's too bad that Miranda had to leave behind his name as well as his homeland. But that's only a tiny part of the much larger social process whereby we began to pressure Miranda to conform to our own narrow and distorted view of the world. Ironically, the writer of this article has stated the basic underlying issue of the Cuban exodus, yet seems to have missed it altogether, as have perhaps most Americans, as have many of the Cuban emigres themselves. Can one ever be truly free at the expense of others? Can human freedom be equated with the marketplace? It was not the Cuban government that determined Miranda's station in life. It was Cuban society and its interplay with the larger forces of modern history. It was also Miranda himself. The mass exodus of people from a country is always an important issue, be it from Mexico, Cambodia, Haiti, or Cuba. In the case of Cuba, the issues are perhaps of greater importance to us because they confront us more directly with how we as a nation affect the lives of other peoples in the world. This inquiry into the causes of recent Cuban emigration leads to a number of broader conclusions. A government that explains complex international issues in simplistic terms deceives its own citizens. Media that report those issues in simplistic terms unwittingly collaborate in the government's deception of the people. And citizens who fail to challenge what they are told about international issues share a moral responsibility for the impact of their government's policies on other peoples.